Uh, welcome everyone to Drisha. We love uh, having everyone with us here to study together. Uh, this is the first class in uh, this series on uh, the Torah of Eliyahu. Uh, this class will discuss how the mysterious uh, prophet is represented in the Bible as a second Moses uh, through an analysis of biblical and rabbinic tests, text. We will attempt to gain insight into the distinctive presentation of Torah that he represents and also the challenges that emerge from that understanding. Uh, this class is taught by Rabbi David Silver. Rabbi Silver is the founder and dean of Drisha Institute of Jewish Education in New York and in Israel. Rabbi Silver, Silver received ordination from the Rabbi Isaac Elhanan Theological Seminary. He's the recipient of the Covenant Award for Excellence in Innovative Jewish Education, and he's the author of a Passover Haggadah, Go Forth and Learn, by Jewish Publication Society uh, uh, 2011. And also, for such a time as this, Biblical Reflections in the Book of Esther, Koran Publishers, 2017. He's also a nationally acclaimed lecturer on the Bible. Rabbi Silver is married to Dr. Dvorah Steinmetz. They have eight children and live in New York City. Uh, and uh, again, I just want to encourage everyone to turn on your video if you're able to, uh, both Rabbi Silver and I would love to see you. Um, feel free to ask questions or um, make comment by uh, writing here in the chat box uh, on Zoom or uh, as a comment on Facebook. If you're, watch, you're watching us live, we'd like to welcome you as well uh, to be part of our class. And uh, with that, I'll turn this to uh, Rabbi Silver. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so this class, um, the topic is a very big one uh, because the character of Eliyahu, which appears primarily in the book of um, Malachim, uh, there are some other references to Eliyahu in the Tanakh, which are interesting. And what's actually quite interesting, and I'm not sure we're going to get to it in this round, but is the presentation of Eliyahu within the Talmud. Uh, the Talmud, the Midrash, I say folk traditions about Eliyahu are extremely interesting. Uh, and we'll get to that someday. I'm not sure in this particular round, it's only three or four sessions, but uh, it's also interesting to look at how he's presented and to see what this, these traditions picked up on in terms of the biblical text, because on its surface, the Eliyahu of the Bible and the Eliyahu of the rabbinic tradition seem quite, quite uh, different from each other. In some ways, almost opposite of each other. But let's start with the presentation of Eliyahu in the Tanakh. The primary place we find Eliyahu Hanavi is in the book of Malachim. And he's introduced to us in chapter 17 of the first book. He ascends to heaven in the second chapter of the second book. So it's actually, and the first book is a short book. It doesn't have that many more chapters to it. The first book of Murachim has a grand total of uh, 20, I think it's 22, 22 chapters. So he appears in chapter 17, 18, and 19. He does not appear in chapter 20 at all, which is interesting. And uh, then he appears again in uh, chapter 21. He does not appear in chapter 22, and he appears in the first two chapters of Malachim Bet. So maybe we'll discuss where he does not appear, which is very striking. But let's begin our study. I, I would say the following. The Book of Kings, basically, Malachim, uh, is sim similar in many ways to the Book of Chronicles, Devei Ayamim. The difference being that or well, the many differences, but one primary difference is that the book of Chronicles concerns itself primarily with the kings of, of Judah, the line of David, which it sees as the sole legitimate kingship. The kings of Israel, the divided kingdom, the kings of the north, are given very uh, short shrift in, the, uh, in, in the Chronicles. That's not true in the book of Kings. The book of Kings deals rather even-handedly with both the kings of the south, which is Judah, David's line, and the kings of the north, Shomron, Ephraim, Israel. The first king of the north is Yeravam, and 10 of the tribes are in the northern kingdom, and only two tribes 
or in the south. Now the prophet Eliyahu Hanavi deals primarily, it's interesting, with the north. His main protagonist, main protagonist in the story, not only, but main protagonist, is the king of Israel, whose name is Achav, who in and of in him himself is a fascinating character. So let's we're going to be dealing with Achav because Achav and Eliyahu are really very much intertwined. They're very much to understand the Eliyahu of the Bible, you have to understand Achav of the Bible. And then we have the mysterious ascent to heaven, which is found in the beginning of the second book. So it's compressed. And it's interesting that Eliyahu also, very importantly, has a, has a disciple. His name is Elisha. And the Eliyahu-Elisha stories, which are fascinating, are at the heart of the Book of Kings. If you take them out of Malachim, what essentially you, you end up with is the kind of Dere Hayamim. This king reigned this amount of time, did this, died, someone took over. It's not quite as dry as Chronicles, but it's pretty dry. But what makes the Book of Malachim a very interesting book is the presence of these two characters, Eliyahu and his disciple Elisha. So we're going to be spending time in Eliyahu. And these two characters are incredibly important in terms of unfolding Jewish tradition. It's also, of course, well known and certainly true that the Christian Bible seized upon Elio and Elisha as two central characters in, in weaving their own story, in their own tradition. So, and of course, Elio appears throughout the Talmud. And we'll get to that at some point in the future. Let's begin now. Before we get to chapter 17, where Elio is introduced, if you want to put it that way, we have to begin with the end of chapter 16. So the first book of Kings, chapter 16, uh, the way the book works is it des describes the kings of the north and the kings of the south. The kingdom is divided into two after the death of Shlomo. So it describes the king of, one of the kings of the north, his name is Omri. It gives a brief biographical description of Omri, actually even beginning earlier in verse number 20, uh, 23. Um, Verse 25, I take it back. Verse 25. And it gives in very short. Bayas Omri, Harabi and Hashem. Bayera Mikol Hashem So Omri did evil in God's eyes. He was the worst of any who came before. He was the worst. The absolute worst king. And then it describes he was how terrible he was. He followed the path of Yeravam. Yeravam and Navat. He caused Israel to sin. He enraged the God of Israel. And then it says, and the rest of his, uh, his career, and, and his uh, exploits, positive term, they're written down, I'll say for some book, the book of Chronicles of the Kings of Israel, a book that we don't have. But, and then he dies. He died. He's buried in Shomron, that's the capital of the north. And Achav, his son, reigns in his place. Kingship is passed down from father to son, typically. So now we have Achav. Now this is a little short biography of Achav. The Achav ben Omri, Malach of Yisrael, Bishana, Shoshim, Ushmona, Shana, Asa, Melach, Yehuda. So he reigned in the 38th year of Asa. Asa is the king of Judah. 38th year of Asa, Achav took the throne. And it says he reigned for 22 years. He reigned for 22 years. And Achav, the son of Omri, did evil in the eyes of God, worse than any that came before him. That's what the biography says. He's the worst to date. And then it says, It wasn't bad enough that he followed the path of Yeravam, first king of Israel, the divided kingdom who caused Israel to sin. He did worse than that. He married Izebel. He marries Jezebel, the daughter of Etbaal, who worshipped Baal, 
I was the foreign god. And he bowed down to it. And not only that, in verse 32, he built an altar to Baal. Beit Baal, the house of Baal. Asher bana b'shamon, which he built in Shomron. Vayas achav et asherah, he made the asherah, another idolatrous sacred post, a sacred tree. Vayosef achav rasot rachis et Hashem or Yisrael, mikom achay Yisrael asher yilufanav. He was the worst. You know, he permitted idolatry. He did idolatry. He marries his evil, etc. Deeply connected to Baal. Now we have the last two verses of chapter sixteen. Actually, the last verse, one long verse. Yishtah, Yishtah, Yoshua in his days, in the days of Achav, Chiel, of uh, a Beit Eli, fortified Jericho. He laid his foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he put the gates in place at the cost of Sigub, his youngest son, in accordance with the words that the Lord had spoken through Yoshua bin Nun. So we have a reference over here to a story that takes place in the book of Yoshua. I'll just read that to you. That's found in Yoshua chapter 6. Know the story of Jericho, Battle of Jericho, the fall of Jericho. Jericho was the first city captured by Israel when we enter the land. We cross the Jordan, we capture Jericho. It's an interesting battle. There's a ceremonial piece of the battle. There's walking around the walls, there's the blowing of the shofar. And it turns out that after Jericho has been uh, destroyed, um, totally destroyed, and uh, at the very end of chapter six of, of Yoshua, the 26th verse says, Vayashba Yoshua ba'eta mar, Yoshua pronounced an oath at that time, after Yericho had been des destroyed. Ish Hashem, Hashem yakum, hazot et Yericho. Whoever rebuilds Jericho is cursed. Bibchoro yisadena he will build it at the cost of his eldest son and his younger son. That's the curse of Yoshua. That's down to the end of chapter 6. So it's forbidden to rebuild Yericho. Whoever does it will pay a severe price. This, we are told, happened, however, in the times of Achav. Not that Achav himself did it, but in his day, the last verse of chapter 16, Chiel, whoever Chiel may be, rebuilds Yericho and pays the price, the oath that Yoshua had uttered. Here it said, Bidvar Hashem Hashem Diber Biyad Yoshua Bidu. And here the text says, God spoke through Yoshua. So that's the end of chapter. So that's the little biography of the end of chapter 16. And now we move to chapter 17. Very striking verse. Let's read one verse of chapter 17. Eliyahu, the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Gilad, said to Achav, I swear, I swear is the formula of an oath. I swear, he says, by the God of Israel, Asher Amaliti Lifanav, literally before whom I stand, stood. But Lamod is typically to serve. Lamod Lusharet. I swear by the God of Israel, whom I serve, before whom I stand. Im Yiye Hashani Mo'ewe Tau Umatar. Kiim Wafid Vari. If there will be dew or rain, Except at my bidding, Rafi Dvari. Now I'll get back to that question of what Dvari means, my my word, whose word? Is it God's word? Or is it Eliyahu's word? 
But let's just think about this verse for a moment. And it's a very striking verse. First of all, what is striking is that this character, Elio, who will be a major character of the book, we have absolutely no introduction to him. It. It's surprising. He it comes out of nowhere. In Elio, the Tishbite from the inhabitants of Gilad said, who are you? So that's very striking. There's no introduction to Elio, except he's a Tishbite, he's a resident, and he's a resident of Gilad. He describes himself as standing or serving God. And then he makes the enigmatic statement, there shall be no do or reign, uh, except if I say so, or except according to my word, leaving open the question, whose word? Rabbi Silver, of course, it's yes. right out of the Shema and out of Devarim, as you say. But uh, so the next time, the next moment is Vayahi Devar Hashem. But I'm saying it's out of the Shema, the middle verse, you know, the middle. Yes, I will get, I will. Yes, okay. that is true. Okay. Okay. That is certainly the case. And I'll, I'll remark on that in, in one moment. But before we get to that statement, as Rosie says very correctly, he's repeating what it says in the Torah. It says, if you worship foreign gods, you had Sarat Hashemayim Vlo Yemata. He had he had to do to the to the rain. The, the Torah speaks of matar. Maybe matar means any kind of precipitation. And we also tawo matar. Um, so what he's really saying is, you have we just read it. In his days, there was the worshiping the foreign gods, and the Torah says in the book of Dvarim, if you worship foreign gods, I will shut up the heavens. There'll be no rain. So he simply is repeating what the Torah says. That is true. And now the question is. The placement of this verse, though, it follows, it follows the story of rebuilding Jericho. So, what is that actually about? Let what, what does it mean to rebuild Jericho? Actually, Yeshua had made this curse, this oath. Whoever does it will pay a severe price. But what symbolically does it mean to rebuild Jericho? It strikes me. That what it means to rebuild Yericho is to undo the capture of Yericho. But if you undo the capture of Yericho, if you undo the conquest of Yericho, which is the first conquest in the land, and not only is it the first conquest in the land, but the battle of Yericho, unlike other battles, is one that has a ceremonial feature to it. The sense of Yericho is we're going to fight in the land, we're going to capture the land, but actually God is helping us capture the land. It was supernatural. No battle more than Yericho suggests that actually it's God who is capturing the land. So what would it mean to say to undo that? If you undo Yericho, then where are you? And the answer is obvious. If you undo Yericho, then where you are is where you were prior to Yericho. But where you were prior to Yericho was on the other side of the Jordan River, or one might say in exile. So the point of the book then is this is a book. Let me just make a preliminary comment about this book because the story of Eliyahu is embedded in the book of Kings. The book of Kings seems to be a, a study of how could it be that after Israel enters the land and possesses the land, that after a certain amount of years, we no longer possess the land. We are in exile. How did that happen? And the book of Kings lays the blame over generations, primarily at the kings of Israel, who have strayed from God, and the people go along with them, so the people are not innocent either. But fundamentally, the book of Malachim is somebody sitting in exile and asking the question, how did we end up in this mess? How could it be that this people, which once had their own land, and all of the miracles it took to get there, and now we're outside the land? How do we account for that? So the book of Kings accounts for it over the course of many generations, many kings, starting with Shlomo, marrying Paro's daughter, et cetera, et cetera. And with Menashe, the divided kingdom, there are many reasons for it. We're not studying Malachim in general. But the point is, it's about exile. And now what, what, what chapter 16 seems to suggest to us, we have two successive kings, Omri and his son Achav, each are described as the worst who ever existed. And in the days of Achav, Jericho was rebuilt and Israel was busy worshiping Baal. So the question is, why 
why do we remain in the land? And remember, the verses that Rosie mentioned from the, from the Shema, the second paragraph of the Shema, the verse that she, that she recalled very correctly says that if you don't, right, if you don't obey, keep the laws, right? There won't be rain, the earth will not produce its produce, and the continuation of that verse, and you very quickly will perish from the land that God has given you. So the verse that Rosie alluded to very correctly, but you have to allude to the whole verse. The first part of the verse talks about not having rain, but the end of the verse talks about exile. And here we have a situation which seems is ripe for exile because we're worshiping foreign gods. The king is bowing down to Baal. He's married to Mrs. Baal. He's never bought at Baal. Truly, you are the truly wicked people of the Bible. And not only that, in his days, Yericha was rebuilt. And in other words, the point being, we are poised, one might say we are spiritually speaking in exile, and we're one step from exile. And now suddenly a character is introduced, a mysterious character is introduced, and his mission, actually, his mission, I think, will be to prevent Israel from going into exile. I'm not sure that's the mission he himself understands, but his role and the role of Elisha in the Book of Kings, they are two people who, through the medium of prophecy, will attempt to keep Israel inside the land. Because without Eliyahu, without Elisha, we're going to be outside the land, as the Torah itself said explicitly. And the one who reminds us of what the Torah said in very stark terms is none other than this mysterious character, Eliyahu, who takes an oath himself, Chai Hashem. And then we have the very uh, ambiguous statement at the end of verse number one, there shall be no dew or rain, kiim lefid dvari, except at, literally at my word. Now the question is, is he quoting God? God says the following, until I say it, there won't be rain. Or is he saying, until I decide, I'm gonna make that decision. And in fact, what's even more striking is we have no statement. The Book of Kings could have said, and God spoke to Eliyahu, go to, go to Achav. Later on, we have that such a statement, but here we don't have that statement. Sounds like somebody talking on his own. And his mission will be, to keep Israel in the land. One might say that he himself is, is, is not in the land. He himself is from Gilad. He's on the other, from the other side of the Jordan. So he's the ultimate outsider. And what's interesting is about Elio, just one other preliminary comment, then I'll stop and take comments and questions. He's a character about whom we know virtually nothing. Doesn't seem to be married. If he is married, we don't know who his wife is. Never mentioned. It's never mentioned that he has children. So we know nothing about his family altogether. And then on top of all that, he seems to come out of nowhere. And he also returns to nowhere. The so-called death of Elio or ascent of Elio, which is very striking. He ascends to heaven in a chariot of fire. So there is no more mysterious character in the Bible, maybe in our tradition, than Elio Hanavi. And because he's so mysterious, this leaves a lot of room for pieces of our tradition to understand him in different ways. But the character that comes to mind, he's the ultimate outsider. But we have other outsiders in our tradition and the most famous outsider we have in our tradition without question would be Moshe Rabbeinu. And Moshe also never enters the land. His grave is not known. He has no family, to, he has a wife and children, but they amount to nothing in the, in the, in the Torah. And uh, so the two characters seem to be very similar. And we, in our study, we'll be looking, of course, at Elio as a kind of Moshe figure. So this is where Elio comes on the scene. He comes on the scene on the, on the cusp of exile. And now we'll see what Elio says and how he, how he responds and how God responds to this mysterious person. Now, let me stop here for a moment. If there are any comments or questions, I'll take them now. 
either in the chat or unmute if you want to speak. If not, I'll just continue. I'm happy to continue. Uh, anybody? Evie, is there, are there anything in the yeah, chat? Yeah, let me monitor. I'm just looking at Facebook for one moment, and then I'll let you know if there's anything um, on there. Okay. I don't see anything on Facebook, and I'm not seeing anything in the chat here. Does anyone okay. uh, want to unmute and ask a question? Oh, it looks like uh, Rosie, right? Rosie? Yeah. yeah. Th this is very interesting because we always think of him as a a distant character, a mystical character. We're almost almost afraid to uh, research who he is. And this will be, you know, just not concretized, but it'll be a lot more, you know, connected to a historia as opposed to a, you know, a fear that we've always had when we were younger, speaking for myself. <laughs> well, there's, there actually is a, there's a ton of, Ariel and Navi is a very central character course in the book of kings he's also a central he's an important character in the talmud and he's a very important character in the in the in the mystical writings we're going to get to that but he is a he is a, a moses character and remember moshe is a leader but he's also a torah he's a torah teacher he's a torah giver so elio is understood within the jewish part of jewish traditions as being a Torah teacher. We'll, we'll get to that. I'm not sure we're going to get to it right away. We'll hopefully get there someday. It's quite yeah, interesting. I think Sarah I, wants to speak as well. Yeah. Yes, Sarah. I'm listening. If, if I understand you correctly, Rabbi Silver, so Melachim, um, uh, the plot happens in Eretz Israel. Uh, yes. But the, the written version is a Babylonian one of the book. Possibly. Somebody is the same in Babylon, and they, it makes sense because the ending of the story is is already uh, on Babylonian land. The, the last it does make sense, yes. So it's a Babylonian book which is based on Israeli law, on Israeli stories, on Israeli oral tradition, because it didn't start out of nothing in Babylon. For I sure. mean, yeah. things start where they happen. And then they go elsewhere, right? Yeah, for sure. So it reminds me also, you know, the Talmud itself, most, many stories in the Babylonian Talmud are about Tanaim and Amoraim of Eretz Israel. So these yeah. stories came to us in a Babylonian version, but they are based on stories which most probably started orally in Eretz Israel. They didn't come out of the blue sky in Babylon. So there is a lot here that the, the oral, oral version, both of Eliyahu and uh, Sefer Melachim and the uh, uh, Chazal stories, start orally in Eretz Israel, but the learned, the written version is Babylonian. That's totally, I totally agree that the, Look, there are probably many, many stories that we were never written down altogether. And the whoever wrote the book chooses what stories to tell. I mean, the truth is that Eliyo in the Talmud, and many, many, many stories of Eliyo, we'll get to that. And it, it appears also in a certain halachot, which the Talmud builds on Eliyo, which are fascinating. Well, we'll discuss all this. It's quite interesting. And I have a particular theory I want to advance, but I want to wait with it till we get much more deeply immersed in Eliyo. Okay, so this is what Eliyo says. And now we have in the beginning of the second pasuk of chapter 17, the word of God came to Eliyo. Now we have the term, the word of God comes to Eliyo. And it says the following, leave, leave says Eliyo, leave says God, leave where you are. Go east. Go east always means leave, go out. Spoken to Achav. Achav is inside the land in the northern kingdom. Leave Achav. Travel eastward. In the start of Benacha Crete, hide out in the wadi of Crete, Asher play Hayadein, which abuts the Jordan River. Yet Arvim Siviti Chalkuelcha Sham. 
you will drink the water from the wadi, from the nachal. I have instructed the ravens to feed you. Vayelech vayas kidbar Hashem, and we all does what God has commanded him to do. Vayelech vayeshef b'nachal krit, asher al He goes exactly what God tells him. Goes eastward. Stands by the wadi krit, by the Jordan. Vayavim mevien lo lechem ubasar baboker, lechem ubasar ba'erev, u'mina nachal yishteh. And the ravens bring him literally bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat towards evening and the water he drinks from the wadi. So let's just reflect for a moment on this picture over here. You have somebody who makes comes to uh, the king of Israel and makes a pronouncement. There will be no, there will be no, there'll be no precipitation. There'll be no rain, right? There'll be no muck. Matar, which is what it says in the Torah. Then the Torah in that in that verse, when it says there will be no rain, the land will not produce anything. So when there's no rain, there's no produce. When there's no produce, there's no food. When there's no food, people starve, people die. That's what Eliyahu said. And we have no evidence that God told him to say it. He seems to volunteer this information. The verse then speaks about exile. You'll be banished from the land or perish from the land. And meanwhile, God says to Elio, let me take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. Go eastward. And I'm going to provide for you water. You'll drink from this wadi. There's still water there. And I'm going to give you food. Bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. When you read about eating bread and meat in morning and evening, what obviously comes to mind to all of us without question is exactly the situation the Torah described in the, uh, in the desert, right? The people in the desert complained in chapter, they have no water and they have no food. Well, God provides water, either sweetens the waters or God allows you to get water out of a rock. God provides you water in the desert. But what about the food? So when it comes to the food, so the Torah says about the food, the food would be, they would eat in the morning and they would eat in the afternoon. There were two meals in chapter 16. So we call the mud, the manna. But in the Torah, actually, it describes uh, the man is the lechem. The Torah also spoke twice, indeed. And that's a question exactly how to relate the two different accounts. But it talks about the so-called slug. Um, uh, for example, in chapter 16 of Exodus, verse number, verse number nine, people had complained about, we have no food. Um, and in verse number four, God said, I'm going to rain down lechem from heaven, bread. And then two verses later in chapter 16 of Exodus, verse number six, Vayom Moshe v'yaron, el b'nei Yisrael, erev, at night, v'yitatem ki Hashem utzi etchem meyeretz mitzrayim. And then Moshe added, Vayom Moshe, Betet Hashem lochem ba'erev basal lecho, v'lechem ba'boker l'spoa. You will have bread at night, says Moshe. You will have, I'm sorry, meat basar, right? God will give you basar ba'erev and lechem ba'boker. So it's exactly unclear. Did this actually take place? Did they have meat every night? Because later in the Torah, they complain they want meat. Leaving that aside, the idea of two meals a day, which are lechem and basar, which is how Moshe describes the food that God will provide for them in the desert and in the same chapter, the previous chapter and the next chapter, it describes how God provides water for them in the desert before they enter the land. That seems quite similar to what we have over here. It's as if to say the people inside the land will not have lechem or basar. 
because there's no rain. But there we go, as far as you're concerned, you don't have to worry about that. You, you, you leave them, you go Kedma. And as far as you're concerned, two square meals a day. Lechem basar baboke, lechem basar ba'erev, and you drink from the, from the wadi. And Eliyahu does exactly as he's told. This is in the words of this chapter, Dvar Hashem. However, and suddenly we come to verse number seven of our chapter, Perik Yud Zayin, Pasuk Zayin. Vayi Bikates Yamim, Vayi Vash Hanacho, Ki Lo Haya Geshem Ba'aretz. But after some time, the wadi dries up. It's interesting, by the way, that the name of the place where Elio, the name of the Nacho, is, uh, we are told, he was commanded to go, both in verse number three, Nachal Crete. And later on, he goes to Nachal Crete, Vayeshev Nachal Crete. So Nachal Crete is an interesting name, Kofresh, you're tough. It appears later in the Elio stories as well, the word Crete, Vachrit means to cut off. The waters which will be cut off. Yes, God sends Eliyahu to a place where there's water, but suddenly there's no water. Can't live without water. And presumably there's, there's no food either. So what's he going to do? There's no, there's no water. So now we have, once again, Dvar Hashem in verse number eight. Dvar Hashem, Now we, you know, the word of God again comes to Eliyahu. Hashem now he commands Elio to go to a place called Tzarfat, which is in Sidon, north, north of Israel. Or maybe it's part of Israel. It's not really clear to me. Sham, you stay there. I have commanded a widow to provide your needs. So sounds like, once again, a good deal. Okay, first God provided Elio's needs by taking him Kedma. He eats two good meals a day. It's, you know, meat and bread in the morning, meat and bread at noon. He has plenty of water. That's not only the Nachal Crete has dried up. But don't worry, I can go to this place in Sidon and there's a, a widow and I've commanded her to take care of him. Okay. And Sidon C- and means Tzedah. So where will you go? Sidon means Tzedah, food. That a is, different kind of food, you know. That's a very interesting point. That's an ex- excellent point, actually. That it probably is a play on that. Good, good point. Very good point. Probably does play on seda, right? Seda la derech, of course. So very good, excellent. Um, so yeah, she's going to take care of you. Fine. So vayakam vayelach tarafata vayavol petach eir. Now we have the story. He comes. He travels. He comes to the gate of the city, door of the city, gate of the city. And there's a, a woman, a widow, who's gathering gathering wood. Ewa cries out, cries out to her. He cries out to her, please give me a little water in your in your jar that I may drink. Somehow he's figuring out this must be the woman. Who's going to care for all my needs? So he calls out right away. Excuse me, ma'am. Give me some water. That's after all her job, right? God has commanded her to feed the prophet. So he cries out to her. So he's going to get the water. He cries out again. Why are you around? He says, I could use some bread too. Get me some bread. So she responds, I swear by your God. That's how the chapter began. And we always taking this oath, there'll be no rain. So that we take, I swear by your God, if I have anything baked at all, I have a little bit of oil in a jug, and a handful of flour in a jar. And I'm gathering wood, a couple of pieces of wood. Because I'm going to bake something for myself and my son. We will eat it. 
Ramatnu, and we will die. He said, the Last Supper. He said, Mr. This guy giving me all these orders about what I should feed you, I'll make a little secret. I don't have anything to give you. In fact, what I'm gathering is the last meal for myself and my child. We have absolutely nothing to eat. So when we all respond to her, says, don't be afraid. Do as you say. But just give me a small portion, a first portion. Give me a first portion. And give it to me. And you and your child will eat after me. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, give me first. You're commanded to feed me first. But give me, then you take the rest for yourself. And then there's a pause. And then he says, Thus says God, the God of oh, hey Israel. This is what the God of Israel has said. He says, this, this, this jar, this, uh, this uh, jug of, of, of flour will never give out, will never be consumed. There will always be more. And the, and the jug of oil will not, will not fail, will not diminish. Until God brings the rains. And she does what he says. And she and Vatochal, he who beta Yamim. So it works this way, this miracle. The cruise of oil is never give out, nor does the flower. This a little bit sustains them. It was just sort of a Hanukkah miracle, you know, it's a sort of, there's a small amount. And there's something there, but the miracle is that it, it doesn't extinguish, it doesn't give out, right? It's interesting, by the way, and we'll get to this sometime in the future, that this character Eliyahu was so mysterious, we have no idea who he is. And one of the traditions about Eliyahu, which we'll discuss sometime in the future, the to topic is very big and very rich, uh, is that he's actually Pinchas. The, the, some Midrashim identify Eliyahu as Pinchas, because they're both zealots. So if he is Pinchas, it's in the tradition that he's actually Pinchas, Pinchas, of course, was the grandson of Aaron. He's uh, the high priest. So it turns out that Eliyahu, in this tradition, is seen as a kind of Kohen. And when you have the Kohen gets the first portion, actually, the Kohen is given the first portion, the Truma, right? So over here, we have him behaving as a priest. In other words, he's the prophet priest. The first portion is due him. He says, give me my portion. And then you, you and your child will eat the remainder, and it's never going to give out. There will always be food there. So that's the miracle of Eliel. Now, looking back at what God instructed him, and this is what happens, right? But now, looking back at what God said to Eliyahu, just to reflect back on what God said to Eliyahu, God said, leave where you are now. I've commanded this widow to feed you. So Eliyahu sets out with the thinking that this widow is, he's going to meet this widow because the widow is going to take care of his needs. She's going to feed him. But it turns out, as we read the story over here, up to and including verse number 16, that actually, I think Elio had it backwards. He's not going to the widow so she can feed him. He's going to the widow so that he can feed her. As she says, I have no food, we're going to die. Oh, I see. And he gets it. Oh, then give me, and in giving me, supporting me, you and your child will, be, will, will, will survive. So now in God is sending Elio back into the community. First, God takes Elio out of the community. He's, he's from the other side to begin with. And it strikes me that what's going on over here is the education of Elio is that to be a prophet does not mean to simply make pronouncements and disappear. But these are your people. So, okay, maybe your, maybe your pronouncement is even correct. But then you have to be willing to pay the price as well can't just be about them, it has to be about us, 
and you're a part of it. So go back and go back to the community, go back there and you figure out a way that you can support her, which is the reason that he's directed back to, to, to this woman. Firstly, he goes out, then of course the waters dry up. The waters dry up because God wants the waters to dry up. Obviously, if God didn't want the waters to dry up, they wouldn't dry up. The same God who can allow the, the little jug of oil never to be short, always there's always enough oil, is the same God who in theory, the God who gets water out of a rock, can also ensure that the nachal, the wadi, doesn't dry up. It dries up because God wants it to dry up. But I would add something else about the food that Elio gets, which is the ravens bring him food in the morning and the ravens bring him food in the evening. The ravens in general, the orev, whatever the orev, it's actually a raven, is, in, is, in, is a classic unkosher animal, right? In fact, the, when it speaks about the orev, orev was the two kings of Midian the wolf and the raven. Uh, Noah sent out the dove and Noah sent out the raven. So the raven strikes me as something negative. In other words, he's being fed in a negative way, which is part of the story. He's being sent out only to teach him that he has to come back. Uh, let me stop at this point and I'll take comments and questions. And then we'll continue with the rest of the chapter, complete the chapter. Yeah, uh, any have comments or questions? I have a quick uh, yes. question from uh, Facebook, uh, Rabbi Silber. Uh, it's, it's actually yes. from earlier, but I just didn't see it. So um, Karen right. is asking, uh, timeline-wise, how much later does Eliyahu appear from Moses? Oh, it's much later. I mean, it's uh, you're talking about hundreds of years later, right? The Book of, book of uh, Kings says that Shlomo built the temple in the 480th year, right? So you're talking about a very long time later. But the point of that is, it's much later. That nonetheless, the character of Elio as described draws upon the character of Moses. We'll get to this later on, because the important point here, I mean, there are many important points, but one of them is Moshe is a central figure in our tradition. Central figures, the way the Bible works, central figures are constantly being referenced. Moshe is referenced in many places. He's referenced explicitly in many places, and he's referenced implicitly. That is to say, other characters are drawn with Moshe in mind. The most striking example, apart from Eliyahu, who's clearly a Moshe character, as we'll see, but the character really was really based upon Moshe, is of course Shmuel. Shmuel is a Moses figure. But I don't mean to suggest he's identical to Moses. No one's identical to Moses. But he has many, many Moses features. He's the great prophet. He um, has no children to follow his ways. He uh, creates the idea of prophecy. As a, he creates prophecy, as it were. Um, he's, a, he's a teacher as well as a prophet. In many ways, mentioned the language of Shmuel. He's called into service, just as Moses is called into service story of the call of Samuel and the story of the burning bush are parallel stories and many other examples as well. And, and actually our, our psalmist understood it. Moshe v'yaron b'kohanav u'shmuel b'koreh shemo. So in other words, in thinking about Elio as a Moses figure, and we'll get to this at some point in the future, I hope, we have to think that that's just Elio. You have Elio as a Moses figure. You have Samuel as a Moses figure. And there's a fourth character, actually, who is certainly related to, the others related as well, but a character who's certainly related to Elio and indirectly to Moshe is, of course, the prophet Yonah. So there are four characters. There's Moshe, Shmuel, Elio, and Yonah. And to understand that we, we have to go more deeply into how all of these characters play off Moshe, and maybe they play off each other, too. That's also possible. So we'll say it's, it's, it will get complicated and quite interesting. But the answer is chronologically is much later, obviously, much, much later. Can I add um, something? Anything else? Can I add something? Yes. Um, I think there is, um, I don't know, parallel or something uh, between a prophet and a magician. Because oh, we'll get to that later. Yeah. So I think oh, we'll get to that later. That's now, Moshe yeah. has something about being a magician. 
like uh, right. So the, the ultimate, right. The uh, the character who actually the prophet as magician, the most striking example of the prophet as as magician miracle worker, would be Elisha, would be Eliel's pupil Elisha. That the it's you know in the why. Christian Bible Jesus basically is based on those two characters exactly. Elisha and then the miracles. Okay. Elisha figures a Jesus more than any other biblical uh, hero. Right, for sure. And so we have to, we will discuss later at some point what that's about. Why all of a sudden, and we all to some extent is magic, but Elisha is a lot of magic. Mm -hmm. And what does that actually say? Well, what is the idea of the miracles of the magic, etc.? So we obviously will deal with that down the road. It's a big topic, actually. We're just getting off the starting here. There's a lot more to say, clearly. Yeah. Um, and there are other differentiations okay. and, and between, you, yeah, between Kohen and uh, Navi. What is allowed, what they're allowed to do, the limitations between uh, them. That's why no, it's funny sure. that Pinchas, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. There's no evidence in the, as far as I can see, in the Bible that Elio is actually a Kohen. Uh, that at least in Malachim. Uh, in, not in Malachim, but the connection to Pinchas, I presume, is that each one is a zealot. Pinchas is a zealot, and so is Eliel is certainly a zealot. And we'll see. We're jumping ahead. We'll, we, will, we will see all these things. They're, they're quite interesting. He's one of these characters that, because there's so many different possible ways to understand him, that different pieces of Jewish tradition pick up different aspects of Eliel. In any event, here's Eliel in the house of this woman providing food for them. Right? As long as they give him first, they have the food. And now we have our story, which begins in verse number 17. <laughs> After these things, the son of this woman became ill. <laughs> he became very ill. <laughs> he had no breath left in him. So the child's going to die. What is there between us? She says to Elio. Can you come to my house to recall my sin and cause the death of my son? So we have to reflect on this very important statement of this woman. What is she saying? She seems in some, in some sense to be blaming Elio for the death of her son. Now, this is a man who's been sustaining them who knows how long, for quite a while, right? And now her son dies, and she turns to Elio. What's your problem, she says. What is there between us? In other words, those are fighting words. What do you have against me? You came into my house to recall my sin and cause the death of my son. What did he, how do we understand that statement that she's making? And we also, we didn't pray that her son should die. We have no evidence of that on any level. What she seems to be saying is the following. Perhaps she's, she's picking saying, up on something. I, I'm just she's thinking this. Maybe she's saying that by his mere presence, he's showing her up. That his righteousness makes her look you know, less than what she is. She's a regular plain person in the nation. And he is right. the Navi with these great miraculous capabilities. And he makes her appear much less than what she was. And she was a regular Joe. And then he comes in and now she's, so now she's being punished for things that she wouldn't have been hadn't he come in. Okay, right. I mean, I'm not sure. I, I would have a slightly different formulation of what you're saying, but I, I, I see in, in her statement the kind of critique, actually. What she's saying is there are different kinds of prophets, different kinds of people. You're somebody who, wherever you go, death is going to follow you because you're the person who sees everything in terms of human failure, human inadequacy. You have, you have a standard that no one can meet, okay? And wherever you go, judgment follows you. And it's true. I mean, here's a guy, first he walks onto the stage, no water. 
which means everybody's you die basically. And who are you? Well, what? Except when I say so. And the point is, what she's saying is, why'd you come here in the first place? I mean, I'd be better off without you because wherever you go, death is soon to follow. So why do you come to me? Why am I deserving of this honor? You know, well, who needs it? Uh, and there's a critique here about Elio and, and, and the prophecy of Elio. I think he, she's saying implicitly, and she says so, I think later explicitly, this in my view is not what a prophet's supposed to be. So when this week makes pronouncements, you know? Now, I think part of that with God had already told that we all go back to this woman who's going to feed you, which means you're going to feed her, right? So he's, he's, I know you think she's going to feed you, but actually you're going to, your job is to take care of that, these people. So he says, why did you come to me in the first place? So wherever you go, judgment follows. You're, you're, you're a prophet of judgment. That's what I think she's saying to him. And now we all responds. So we'll just finish it up today and we'll continue this next time. Let me just briefly read this. Give me your son. Takes her son. And he places this child on his bed. He cried out to God. Hashem oh my God. Even the woman with whom I dwell who cares for me, you will, you will harm her, you will do evil, you will kill her child. So he find for the first time two interesting things to praise, which is a very much a Moshe Rabbeinu. It's a Moshe is, is our advocate, right? He prays. And I'm reminded of the first time Moshe confronts God in an, in an accusatory way. Moses' Moses' first accusatory statement to God. And here we have Eliyahu praying to God in the same language, actually, which at which the Talmud will pick up. He prays to God in a very accusatory way. Even this woman, even the, even the good ones? Now, that's not a, a prayer that probably would have Past they were all's lips, you know, a few verses earlier. But what is this? He says, Why are you harming even the good ones, even the ones who care for me, even the ones who take care of me? Lama Hari Ota. So he cries out to God. So we have Elio as one of the great people who pray. Elio in prayer. That's going to become very important for, the, uh, for our tradition. And we'll see this actually in the stories. And of course, the Talmud will pick this up. And now he says, He stretches out over this child three times. <laughs> Cries out to God. <laughs> Let the soul of this child return to its body. Let's bring the child back to life. There's a kind of, uh, kind of resurrection. Resurrect the child. That's the prayer of Eliyahu. And by Yishma Hashem B'Kol Eliyahu, and God heeds the, 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 the voice of Eliyahu. I'm not going to finish the chapter now because there's a lot more to say. Uh, but uh, there's something very interesting about this incident. I just want to make one last comment about the incident, the next time we'll just continue with the story. Because the, the woman gets the last word in the chapter, a very interesting uh, word. But I mentioned before at the outset that actually, at this point in time, Israel is ready to go into exile. We're serving Baal, we will be rebuilding Jericho, we should be out. And Eliel's role is to keep us in, actually. That will be his role. And I want to simply remind all of us of a story that appeared in the very beginning of the, this book of Kings, way before we met Elio. That's the story of King, Shlop, King Solomon. King Solomon asked God for wisdom. And after God grants Solomon wisdom, there's a little story about two women who come in his court, two prostitutes. And they come with two children. One is alive and one is dead. And each one claims the living one is theirs. Shlomo says, okay, we can't decide. We have no evidence. So the first mission in Bava Metziah, 
If you don't know what to do, yachoku, you divide. So let's cut the baby in half. And you can have half and you have half. That sounds like a fair decision. One woman says, that sounds brief. That sounds reasonable to me. The other one says, no, no, forget that. Let the other one have the baby. So Shlomo, she's the real mother. The one who says, let the other one have the baby. Cares about her baby. But the point of the story, apart from Shlomo's wisdom, is something different. The wisdom of Shlomo keeps the baby in one piece. That's the wisdom. And the point of that story, the beginning of the Book of Kings, the Book of Exile, which actually starts with a divided kingdom, a nation divided cannot stand. That's the point of this book. Shlomo's wisdom keeps the baby in one piece. And what's interesting is that the Book of Kings then comes back to this image of the baby, the child. The children of Israel are supposed to be in exile. Can we keep this baby alive? Can we keep the baby inside the land? And that's the point of the story that Elio, through his prayers and through his prophecy, will be able to sustain the baby, at least for, this, for his time, he's going to keep the baby alive. And his disciple, Elisha, will have a parallel story as well. But once Elisha's gone, that's no longer possible. Then the history will just unfold as the Book of Kings sees it, uh, sees that it inevitably will, which is exile. So the story, though, here, of course, it's never, every story has a context. And one of the contexts is that very first story, that image of the child will be cut in half, in which case it will die. Or can it be, can it be intact? And this idea of the child as a, as a, as a symbol will, is revisited here in our chapter and the next chapter. So I'll stop here. And next time we will just complete the story over here and see what the woman says there we are with the end. This is very striking. <laughs> and then we'll continue with the next story of Elio and Don Carmel. And then chapter 19. Uh, okay, are there any final comments here before we stop for the day? One small comment about yes. the, uh, to reinforce the, the image of uh, Elia who's being fed the, the, the water and the bread like the man. The second yes. With the with the woman with the the almana, there's just a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil, as if it only lasts for one day. There's just enough for one day, like right, the, point. the Omer yes. was just for one day. Right, exactly, exactly. It's mm -hmm. you know that's that's a very important point about the mud in general. You, you get mm -hmm. you live on faith. You only have for the day, right? And you also get what you. Oh, what what you need to exist? You don't get more. You, not what you want. It's what you need. This is part of the mud. Mud is a very central story, and it's an excellent point. It's a little bit each day. <clears throat> it's exactly what you need, which of course is a very is a, is a, is very central to the story of the mind. Thank you for that. It's a good good point. And okay, parallel so to that, parallel to that, we learn a lot about staka through the sages, the stories. You know, the more you give, the more you'll have. You know, it's almost like you know stone soup. The old children's tale keep on you know throwing in you know pitching in together you'll have something in the end you know okay so thank you all very much and we will continue uh, hopefully next week okay thank so, you thank you, thank you. Really nice. wonderful thank you. class wonderful thank, thank you, you evie yeah. also hi sarah hi hi all the thank best you. to everybody also, also. Thank, so Thank you so much, Rabbi Silver. Great opportunity to learn with you. And thank you everyone who joined us here today on Zoom, on uh, Facebook, and also on uh, Drisha Live. Uh, our next live class is actually also with Rabbi Silver uh, at Sunday at uh, 10 a.m. Oh, I believe there's actually a live class. Maybe I'm wrong. I think there's also a live class this evening. Forgive me if I'm wrong with, um, yeah, with Rabbi Nitzarna. Um, So we have uh, the class this evening with Rabbi Nitzarna. And then we also have uh, the class on uh, Sunday uh, with um, Rabbi Silber on the family of Jacob and uh, the sale of Joseph at 10 a.m. Uh, we hope to see you at uh, all of our other uh, upcoming classes. So you can um, uh, look at our website for uh, additional information uh, and current class offerings. We always have many classes happening. Uh, our website is www.drisha.org slash classes. And you can also watch recordings of previous classes um, at www.drisha.org slash live.
Uh, thanks again for joining us, everyone. And I can't wait to see you at one of our upcoming classes uh, here at Risha. Play it